if we can, I'd like to, I know we just said the rosary, but I always like to begin with a prayer uh, to our Blessed Mother, so if you could join me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn them, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, for, uh, when I came back to the church about ten years ago, I never kind of expected what eventually came into full focus. You know, I was a, uh, my father was a convert from being a Nazarene, which is kind of a radical Lutheran sect. Uh, in the United States. Radical, he tells me, because when he was a little boy, he was forbidden from going to movies. Maybe they had something right there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he converted to the faith in the 1950s, uh, a few years after he met my mother, who was Irish Catholic. Uh, so that was the background, the home I was raised in. There was never any thought of ever skipping Mass on Sunday. Uh, or Holy Days. I was an altar boy, went to Catholic school my entire life. I've had 18 years of education. Every bit of it has been in a Catholic classroom. So I come from a very Catholic background. And yet still, uh, once I got to Notre Dame, the wheels started to come off the wagon. And by the time I got out into my secular career in television, they'd essentially pretty much come off altogether. Um, so when I came back to the faith, seriously came back to the faith 10 years ago uh, on the insistent on the prayers of my mother who had prayed incessantly to our Lord for 15 years to uh, save the lives of her two sons, the spiritual lives, the souls of her two sons. Uh, she eventually uh, developed cancer and over the course of almost three years offered all of that suffering up for both my brother and myself. And uh, as a result, I'm happy to say that my mother is St. Monica, uh, plays a very close parallel to St. Monica. Will, will, remains to be seen about the Augustine part of it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so my story is in a sense kind of, uh, kind of something that of the prodigal son, a little bit of analogy there. But you know, we don't read in the Gospels when our Lord presents the story of the prodigal son, we don't read that the prodigal son came back to a house that was ramshackled and the windows blown out, and the walls torn down, and the fields set on fire. And when I came back to the faith, that was not my initial vision, but it quickly became the reality in front of my face. And I looked around and was said, what's going on? How can this many Catholics not believe the faith? How can many of this many Catholics don't know the faith? How is it that this many Catholic leaders simply don't teach the faith? What's going on? What's going on? So once something becomes very clear to you, you can never unsee it. It is what it is. And many of us have probably seen those, uh, those kind of cool paintings where they tell you, look, in, look at the painting and you'll see another painting mixed in there somewhere. And you stand there kind of like a dork for 40 minutes going, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, I see it. And now you can never not see it. Well, that's kind of what this experience has been like for me. And I've happened to have bumped into many, 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 many other people who have the same experience. That the faith is disregarded by large numbers of those who are responsible for passing it down to us. Now, they don't like it when you talk like that. Too bad. Souls are more important than your feelings. I'm sorry. So when we look through the uh, Old Testament and we run into the prophets, particularly Jeremiah, generally when we hear cases referring to, or passages referring to Jerusalem, we can oftentimes take those passages and apply what's being said about Jerusalem to the church, 
Because after all, the church is the new Jerusalem, and the church triumphant in heaven is the heavenly Jerusalem. So when you read something about Jerusalem, it should make your mind wander beyond just the historical reality of what was being talked about. So if I would indulge me for a moment, I'd like to read you from uh, the, one of the canticles of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a great, great prophet, my personal favorite. He was a great prophet. And uh, uh, so here's what he says about Jerusalem. Let my eyes stream with tears day and night without rest over the great destruction which overwhelms the virgin daughter of my people, over her incurable wound. If I walk out into the field, look, those slain by the sword. If I enter the city, look, those consumed by hunger. Even the prophet and the priest forage in a land they know not. Have you cast Judah off completely? Is Zion loathsome to you? Why have you struck us a blow that cannot be healed? We wait for peace to no avail, for a time of healing, but terror comes instead. We recognize, O Lord, our wickedness, the guilt of our fathers, that we have sinned against you. For your name's sake, spurn us not, disgrace not the throne of your glory. Remember your covenant with us, and break it not. How many people today recognize the condition of the church today in that canticle from Jeremiah? So many people are so hurt and so aggrieved by the condition of the church. A condition of the church, by the way, that many people like to point back to the 1960s and say, ah, oh, it was all that Vatican II stuff. That Vatican II stuff had been prepared for, for close to a hundred years before Vatican II began. One of the great moments here in the church that we find ourselves is what Bishop Athanasius Schneider uh, from Kazakhstan has called the fourth great crisis of the church. And there's no denying it, there's no getting around it. If you go down and you say, well, what are the other three crises? The first one was the Arian heresy. The next one was the schism with the Orthodox. The next one was the great Protestant heresy, which is still with us. And now this one. And in some sorts, as you flow through the sort of the chronological, historical timeline of those heresies, of those horrible crises the church faced, they all sort of build on one another. The crisis that we're in today, Pope, uh, Pope St. Pius X called uh, the heresy of modernism, and he called modernism the synthesis of all heresies, because everything that we have seen from the past is all present right now. The Arian heresy, just as a reminder, was a uh, fourth and fifth century heresy. That's why we have the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, the Council of Nicaea, was called to combat that heresy. Uh, we have there, the denial of the divinity of Christ. We come to the uh, schism with the West and East, the Eastern Orthodox. And what do you have there is you have a denial of the authority of the Pope. You come to the Protestant heresy. And what do you have? You have a denial of not only the authority of the Pope, but the authority of the Church. In Protestantism, everybody's his or her own pope. You read the Bible, even though it's not the correct Bible. You read the Bible, you decide what it means for yourself, and that's it. If you get enough people who agree with you, you form your own church until someone in there disagrees with you, and they go form their own church. And that's what it is. Not politically correct to talk about it in those terms, but you know, I think we've had enough of political correctness for the last 50 years. So. I would like to read to you a paragraph from uh, a book written by uh, Blessed John Henry Newman. Now, uh, he was an Anglican convert, rose to be a cardinal in the church, uh, wonderful, wonderful holy man, great insights, had a 
tremendous understanding back in his day, <laughs> at the beginning of the 19th century. He was born in 1801. Even then, he recognized that something has to emerge from the laity. You know, these great things we see in the church happen, they never happen overnight. They happen at the minimum in, in decades of preparation. Great movements occur and great spiritual warfare where huge armies are gathered and put into position, sometimes not even being aware of, that, of, what that's, of what's going on. They don't have necessarily a conscious awareness of this. But heaven does, and so does hell. Every now and then you run into a great, great saint like John Henry Newman, who can see the big picture. And here is what he said about the Arian heresy. There was the temporary suspense of the function of the teaching church, as about 80% of the bishops fell into heresy. The body of bishops failed in their confession of the faith. There were untrustworthy councils, unfaithful bishops. There was weakness, fear of consequences, misguidance, delusion, hallucination, endless, hopeless, extending itself into nearly every corner of the Catholic Church. The episcopate, whose action was so prompt and concordant at Nicaea on the rise of Arianism, did not, as a class or order of men, play a good part in the troubles consequent upon the council, and the laity did. The Catholic people, in the length and breadth of Christendom, were the obstinate champions of Catholic truth, and the bishops were not. Of course, there were great and illustrious exceptions, first Athanasius, Hilary, the Latin Eusebius, Vodabius, after them Basil, the two Gregories, and Ambrose. And again, in speaking of the laity, I speak inclusively of their parish priests, so to call them, at least in many places, but on the whole, Taking a wide view of history, we are obliged to say that the governing body of the church came short and the governed were preeminent in faith, zeal, courage, and constancy. This is a very remarkable fact, but there is a moral in it. Perhaps it was permitted in order to impress upon the church at that very time passing out of her state of persecution to her long temporal ascendancy the greatest evangelical lesson that not the wise and powerful, but the obscure, the unlearned, and the weak constitute her real strength. It was mainly by the faithful people that paganism was overthrown. It was by faithful people under the lead of Athanasius and the Egyptian bishops, and in some places supported by their bishops or priests, that the worst of the heresies was withstood and stamped out of the sacred territory. Wow. He said that over 200 years ago, talking about over 1,600 years ago. You should take great heart. God does not abandon his people, even when some of the leaders do. God does not. We must come to terms with and recognize this crisis in the church. We have great men right now speaking out about this crisis in very clear terms. Bishop Athanasius Schneider is one of them. His Eminence Cardinal Burke. God bless Cardinal Burke. Cardinal Muller, at the synod that we were at, <clears throat> the synod on the family we were just at, Cardinal Muller, Gerhard Muller, the uh, prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, called a spade a spade quite a few times. Cardinal Pell from Sydney, Australia, said, end this manipulation. And many, many, many bishops, we can assure you, some of whom we've talked to, are aghast at what is going on in the church. So where are we here? 
we have arrived at a point in the history of the church where you have the opportunity to become glorious saints. That's where we have arrived. In the midst of all of this confusion, and as Jeremiah called it terror, we look for healing and terror comes instead. How many of you here have family members who have left the faith? Keep your hands up. How many of you have prayed for those family members to come back? You pray for healing and terror comes instead. We are in what the Asians call interesting times. <laughs> and when you are told, may you live in interesting times, you should run as fast as you can in the other direction. <clears throat> because it is not a blessing. <laughs> On an earthly level, it is not a blessing. But on a spiritual level, it is a great blessing. You have the opportunity in the midst of a culture that despises everything about you to stand up and be counted for our blessed Lord and the truth of his holy Catholic Church. Now, we shouldn't get lost in some sort of romantic notion of, uh, uh, you know, that, oh, here we are, knights and fighting dragons and all. That's a nice, nice picture in your head. But the truth is, oftentimes, this battle will be very lonely. You will find no support or very little support, passing support among family or friends, people you know at work, colleagues, people who used to be buddies, but now kind of want to back away from you because they sense something weird about you. <laughs> something kind of crazy, you know. I know you've already had Canadian Thanksgiving, but our American Thanksgiving is coming up, and I wonder every, you know, American Thanksgiving has this great big huge, goes on for days, and you know, it's a big huge long weekend, and there's lots of time for people to reconnect, and it's that one time a year, because most people get off sometime on Wednesday, Thanksgiving's on Thursday, almost no one goes to work on Friday, and you got Saturday and Sunday, so family members come in, and I often wonder, how many faithful Catholics see this, see Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, because of the time period, as this great trial and tribulation? Because, you know, Aunt Marjorie's going to come bounding into the house, and she's going to stay there, and she's going to dictate that, you know, what are you saying grace for like that? And it's always a fight. The faith is always a fight. If it's not a fight in here, it's a fight out there. And if it's not a fight out there, it's in here, but most of the time, it's both. But saints are forged in that crucible. You know, if you go through the breviary, there's different feast days and uh, you know, memorials and that sort of thing for all the different uh, uh, you know, holy men and women who have preceded us. And it's very funny, every now and then you'll come across something like, uh, I don't know, you know, making it up, you know, St. John Smith and Companions. And you never know who the companions are. I guess you find out when you're in heaven, but I've always thought of that as, well, that's kind of a bit of a smack in the face. <laughs> Why was John Smith so great? And he just, the rest are just old and companions. <laughs> You should try not only to be companions, but you should try to be John Smith. <laughs> we all should be. This is what we're called to. In the face of this crisis that we are in, we have two sort of divisions that have arisen in the church. On the one side, we have people who deny the crisis. Or they say, oh, no big deal. Oh, the church has gone through 100,000 crises before. Oh, it's not that, you know, this is just kind of routine. This is just cost of doing business. Yet, yeah, that betrays a monumental ignorance that there are degrees of crisis. It's the distinction between having a cold and having cancer. You don't just say to someone who tells you, hey, I just got diagnosed with cancer. Ah, don't worry about it, you know, everybody gets colds. It's an inappropriate response. It is insufficient to the day. Many of these people 
run parishes. Many of these people have some sort of bully pulpit or microphone to speak from. Many of these people have collars and miters on. And many of these people have actually brought about the crisis or continue to allow it to go on. There are a hundred reasons why. If you want to know, watch a Vortex episode. But uh, <laughs> the point is, this is an unrealistic, insufficient response to the day. On the other side, you have people who see the crisis, absolutely understand it for what it's worth, have done all the historical research, understand that there are unfaithful people, that there are, uh, you know, that various members of the hierarchy have simply lost the faith. They simply do not believe the Catholic faith anymore. And yet their response is, well, we're going to go set up our own type of Catholic church, and we want you all to come over to it. Wrong. Wrong diagnosis, wrong cure. You become saints by remaining in the church and fighting for the church. And I will offer to you that these two positions are the positions of cowards. This side never has to pick up a weapon and fight in the church because they refuse to recognize that there's something to fight for. Everything's fine, everything's good. It's the church of lilies and sunshine and daffodils. Oh, we have a problem every now and then, but we've always had a problem. Move on, folks, nothing to see here. They're cowards. They won't fight. This group over here won't fight either. They want to set up their own little independent chapels and parishes and all go off and live in some little thing and wait for Rome to come back to them. Holy Mother Church is sick. She is laying on her sick bed. She needs her loyal sons to come around and tend to her, not go and find a different mother. So what do we do? We're not bishops, unless there's somebody sitting out there hiding. <laughs> we don't have any authority, the laity in the church, not really. You got appointed to some council or, you know, you're the guy that tells father, well, you really shouldn't spend that money on, you know, fixing the kneelers, father. <laughs> and that's about the end of the authority. And that's the way our blessed Lord set it up. Anybody here feel like they want to run the church? No, thank you. But we are to love the church. And we are to do whatever it costs us personally. And it will cost you personally. Probably the most you will have to endure, at least in 2014, is people making fun of you. That's about it. Now, some people, that's a big deal. He said, I'm not very nice. I'm done. Man up. That means you too, ladies. <laughs> Who cares what somebody says about you? Really? Or is your skin really that thin that you care that somebody doesn't like you because you told them that contraception is an evil thing and they said, oh, you're a horrible bigot? And that makes you go retreat into your cave? How childish. How many of you here have been baptized and confirmed? You have gifts from the Holy Spirit to go out and change the world. What are you doing with them? You have to get into fights with people. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go looking for them. And as all of us know, you don't ever have to go looking for them. They come to you. You must speak up, regardless of the consequences. You owe that 
to Jesus Christ, who gave you the gift of the Catholic faith from all eternity. Before he created the angels, he knew you. He knew that he was going to create you for this time and place, and that he would give you the gift of everlasting life and the gift of the Catholic Church. That places a responsibility on us. We don't get to skate or ignore, worry about it, you know, annoying Aunt Marjorie. You have to go out and save Aunt Marjorie's soul. And if that means you gotta get down on the floor and wrestle around with her at Thanksgiving dinner, well then get on the floor. <laughs> Think about what happened in the early days of the church. You talk about a crisis. I mean, the church is barely you know, a few weeks old. And there's already a crisis in the church. Arguing over, uh, um, how do you say it politely? Well, anyway, you know. Uh, and immediately there's a crisis. And then St. Paul is walking around, going from place to place, you know, either founding churches or going to ones he's already founded and writing letters and writing things up. And all of a sudden there's this group of guys, Judaizers, walking around behind him undoing everything he says. So he goes into Corinth, and they say, you know, he's, you know, he tells them the truth of the faith, and then he moves on to Ephesus, and then the Judaizers roll up in Corinth and said, oh, everything Paul said, oh, that's all wrong. No, 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 no. We have to remain good, faithful Jews, hence the name Judaizers. And this is going on all over the place. Paul loses his mind over this in his letter to the Galatians. How many of you have read the letter of Galatians? Letter to the Galatians. Ah, I see I have a Protestant group here, some Protestants among us. Good, very good. He calls them stupid. Now, depending on which translation you may happen to read, which edition, that's the polite word. He says at one point, a couple of verses, he goes, Oh, you stupid Galatians. So, it's very clear that the Church of Nice did not exist in St. Paul's vocabulary. At one point, about three or four verses later, he says, of the Judaizers, who remember are walking around saying that you have to uh, follow Jewish ritual laws and uh, you know, the male child has to be circumcised or you can't come into the church. And he goes nuts and says, Oh, those going around saying this, I wish they would take that scalpel, that knife, and go down a little lower and castrate themselves. That's what it says. To show the intensity when you are in love with the truth and somebody demands a change in the truth, that is to be your reaction. Your first thought is not, well, how can I approach this politely? Eternal lives are at stake. This is not about winning an argument. It is not about a principle. It is about heaven and hell for all eternity. The only response, the only response is an impassioned response. Because you love souls. St. Paul wasn't sitting around thinking, well, they're disagreeing with my argument, so therefore that makes me look weak as I move into the next town. He cared about souls. He had had the personal, personal encounter with the Lord of heaven and earth. And it changed him. And he eventually got his head cut off for it. But along the way, he suffered mightily in the body as he fought outside and then inside he has that revealing quote of the thorn in my flesh a demon to beat me and I've prayed to God to remove this from me and he says nope I'm going to leave that there so that you remain weak because in your weakness my power is made manifest it's all about fighting, my fellow Catholics. You get to rest in heaven. Here, it's about fighting. Every day, every hour, every single battle that pops up in front of you, you 
fight. That is the only response to a crisis. There is no other response. You don't get to retreat. One of the saints said, from this battle, there is no retreat. You fight and you win by dying fighting. If you retreat, you go to hell. Why do we care about, why do we care about our family members who have left the faith? Because we understand the great eternal danger they have exposed themselves to. That's why. My mother didn't pray for me for 15 years and finally throw up her hands about two weeks before, three weeks before she got the diagnosis of cancer and say, Jesus, I don't care what you have to do to me. Do whatever you have to do, but spare the eternal lives of my two sons. That's why she said that. Her cancer wasn't a pleasant experience. It wasn't just some afterthought. She prayed for a cross to be able to save the eternal lives of her two sons, one of whom is standing here in front of you. Out of love of souls. Out of love of souls. There's not a saint in the history of the church who did not love souls more than he or she loved him or herself. It was always about souls. And when you free yourself up to care about nothing but souls, all this other stuff doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. You just don't care what somebody says about you. Why should you care? If you're willing to keep your mouth shut in a situation where you have the opportunity to either defend or promote our blessed Lord and you keep your mouth shut, that means you love God, you love yourself more than you love God. That's it. I mean, that's what it is. You can come up with all kinds of rationalizations and say, well, you know, no, it's not that. I just don't want to offend them and then we'll close the door on communication. We won't be able to talk to them some other point down the road and we'll want them to come over for dinner. And at the bottom of all of that is, if I do this, my relationship with them is going to be messed up and I don't want that to happen. Your relationship with them is already messed up because you believe in an omnipotent God that wants people to go to heaven and does everything he can to the point of dying on a cross to do that, and they do not. You have no basis for a relationship because they reject that. Your relationship is that you were baptized into the Catholic faith so that you could save your own soul through cooperating with grace, and then that, given that gift that you were given freely, that you would then extend it to others freely. That's why we're sitting here today, because 2,000 years ago, men and women all over what is modern-day Israel did that. And they sacrificed their lives for you so that their faith would be passed on. The faith that had been given to them would be passed on and eventually go on to you. That's why I'm standing here. That's why you're sitting here. Let's just call it like it is, should we? This is what it is. We have no business not speaking the truth completely and fully. And then whatever happens, happens. It's not up to us to control that. We weren't commanded to go out and control all the events and everything, and when we say something, then make sure this happens, and then follow the person around and make sure that... We're commanded to tell the truth. Go out to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. And know that I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. Nowhere bracketed in there is it, oh, and by the way, you're going to have a really holy life, and here's the plan to go ahead and chase Aunt Marjorie around and make sure. You just tell the truth. You tell the truth. You always tell the truth. And you prepare for the cross that you will get when you tell the truth. Mother Angelica once said, if you aren't suffering for the faith, then you're not living the faith. This is how you can become a saint today. Because of this crisis in the church, the world is rocketing to hell 
because the only institution that can prevent that has fallen asleep at the switch. Nothing on earth can fight the diabolical other than the Catholic Church. Governments can't do it. The United Nations can't do it. The World Council of whatever can't do it. They can't do it because they, are all, they all succumb to the diabolical eventually, and many of them are actually born in the bosom of the diabolical, conceived there. But the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church alone, because of its charter and its founder and its protection in truth, only the Catholic Church can reverse what's going on. It was the Catholic Church that brought the Roman Empire to its knees and converted it with much bloodshed. It was the Catholic Church that converted hordes of barbarians and established what eventually became the nations of Europe with much bloodshed, much cost. It was the Catholic Church that preserved civilization beginning on the tiny little Isle of Ireland and then slowly creeping across Europe with much, much sacrifice. It was the Catholic Church through the monastic traditions and the monasteries that brought peace to an entire continent kept order with much suffering, much sacrifice. It was the Catholic Church that brought us the sacred scriptures. As those monks sat in those little scriptoriums, freezing cold, boiling hot, with a candle next to their table, horrible vision, scratching away on vellum with a little pencil, the quill, dipping in ink that they had to make, all for the love of souls. We need to ask ourselves, as this generation of the church, what price have I paid for souls. What have I done? Will I ever get listed as companions here? Will anyone ever even consider 50 years after I'm dead that I was ever even alive? Did I do something great for God? Not, did you become famous? Did I do something great? Did I give everything I have to God? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. And you shall therefore love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Drill these words into your children. Preach them far and near. We have the incredible gift to be able to love God in the flesh. No one else on earth has that. No one. We do. It doesn't make us better as individuals, but it proves the manifest love for us that God has. It was at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John that he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. He never left us. 
we don't get to treat this as it's just some commonplace thing. The Blessed Sacrament, the gift of the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church that gives us the Blessed Sacrament, gives us Jesus in the flesh, gives us the ability to be restored to our baptismal purity by participation in the Sacrament of Confession. We have everything among us to save the world. So why is the world in such a hellish state? Why is the world so desperate? Why are so many, even among ourselves, running off to fake imitation Catholic churches? Why are they chasing after false apparitions? Every time some goofball on the internet says they had a vision of the Blessed Mother, instantly 100,000 people go visit them. Why? Because we do not understand the treasure we have right in front of us. And we don't fight for it because we don't understand it. When we don't understand it, we don't love it enough. In a crisis, you must react in a critical fashion. When everything is normal in your house, you simply walk in and out of the door. When your house is on fire, you run around, you scream, you grab people, you cause all kinds of commotion, and you bolt out the door. That's prudence. Prudence is not being a softy, being afraid to say something. The virtue of prudence is the appropriate response, sufficient to the situation. That's what prudence is. It's why in some cases, prudence is called the queen of virtues. Because it doesn't matter what virtues you have, if you're not exercising them correctly given the situation, well then who cares? We have lost all sense of our Catholic faith. It's clear. If you want to know how the church is doing, all you have to do is look at the world. It's that clear. In the United States, uh, the Archdiocese of New York just announced last weekend, I think it was last weekend, the shrinking of another 55, I think it was, parishes, you know, four or five dozen more parishes. That's on top of 27 they closed I think it was five or six years ago. Everywhere we see shrinking, everywhere we see retreat, our own archdiocese of Detroit, I think it was 60 parishes they were closing, they announced that a year or two ago. The Archbishop of Detroit, Alan Vigneron, announced at the press conference that only 15% of Catholics who are on the rolls actually attend Mass in Detroit, so we don't need these many churches. There's not enough people in them to keep, you know, to pay the heat bill. Cardinal Dolan of New York announced during his closing of Parish's statement that 12% of the people in New York go to Mass, of Catholics in New York go to Mass. So we don't need all these buildings. These are horrible, critical situations, crisis times. And I just single those two out because one, I live in Detroit, and two, New York just happened. These things are happening all over the world. A kind of heart-stopping smack-across-the-face statistic, I've told a few crowds, is that in the Netherlands, there are 16 million people, 4.1 million are Catholic, baptized Catholics, so roughly 25% of the population. 500 years ago, it was 100% of the population. Thank you, Protestant Reformation, or Protestant Revolt. So you have 25% of the population is Catholic. 4,100,000 baptized Catholics on the rolls. Of the 4,100,000, 100,000 go to Mass. 2%. And most of that 2%, because we've been there and sat in the churches and looked, <laughs> most of that 2% either have white hair or no hair. 
What will that be in 10 years? How does this turn around? What's the plan? How is any of this fixed? On the grand scale, humanly speaking, it can't be. Humanly speaking, it can't be. But on the spiritual plane, sure it can be. But the spiritual plane means you. It means you. It means me. It means standing up and saying what the truth is. And as St. Thomas More would say, we must clamor like champions if we have the spittle for it. You have to pray for the spittle. You have to pray for the grace to be a witness to our blessed Lord and his faith and his Catholic Church. God, give me the strength to show the world your glory. I abandon myself to your will. Do with me whatever you have to do with me, but save souls. And this means challenging a culture. It means getting down in the dirt with people you know and making sure that they understand the stakes. Which is an eternity in hell. That's the stakes. That's what we're talking about. This isn't whether your favorite team or the other guy's favorite team wins the game and at the end of the game you have a beer and go home. We're talking about hell. We're talking about heaven. And they need to understand that. Now this is going to cost you. And you all know it. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You all know that this is going to cost you. You open your mouth and the Human Rights Commission, right? Oh, they don't like people who are gay, so we're going to take away their house. You won't need a house in heaven. You've got a mansion waiting for you. Don't make them put me in jail. Well, St. Paul was in jail. You've got good company. All of this requires a radical transformation in how we live the faith. Because the times, they are a radical. And radical comes from the root, the root word for radical in Latin is radicere. It's the, it means root, the basic, go back to the beginning, the absolute core. We've been so mowed over. Don't say that. Someone's feelings will be hurt. Don't talk about hell. You know, the church doesn't really talk about hell anymore. You know, we don't really believe that. You know, when whoever it is dies, they're in heaven. Doesn't matter who it is. You have to know the faith. Not just what the church teaches, I'm going to presume, probably rightfully so, that almost everybody here knows what the church teaches about something. But do you know why the church teaches what it teaches? Have you poured into the intellectual life of the church? I don't mean going getting a degree. You know, if you want to do that, that's fantastic. But have you read over the encyclicals? Have you prayed as you start to read an encyclical? Have you opened up the lives of the saints and heard what they had to say? Have you taken whatever time you have in your lives, and that's an individual question because everybody has different lives and different circumstances, but whatever time you have in your life, have you taken and set aside some of it, even to the exclusion of things you like that are perfectly legitimate pleasures, and said, I am going to dedicate this time to learning the faith 
because I love you, my blessed Lord, and I want to be able to defend you and promote you for the love of souls. And so therefore, today, starting today, I am going to set aside X amount of time every day. In addition to whatever I already do devotionally, I'm going to set aside time right now to understand the nature of this crisis, to understand what the answers to this crisis are, and figure out how to incorporate those into my life so that I can be a shining example, so I can sit down and have an intelligent discussion with somebody. Remember, every single person we talk to has within themselves, even if it's just one the smallest measure possible, they have within themselves the truth. Because they come from God, they were created from the hand of God, and they have that spark of the divine life in them. However much it's besmirched, no matter how much it's smudged over and unrecognizable, it's there. And you never know what you say, how that may correspond to them. There's a beautiful line in the Psalms, deep is calling on deep. And when you speak from the depth of truth, that other person has the capacity to hear it. What they do with it, they do with it. But they have the capacity to hear it. Every single human soul is given sufficient grace to be saved. You may very well be the instrument of that grace for that person. You might lose your job, you might lose your reputation, you might lose your friends, you might lose your life. But I'll wrap up my talk here with the last two verses from the letter of St. James. Brothers, know that whoever brings another brother back from the error of his ways will not only save his own soul from death, but will cover a multitude of sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls, Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, sorrowful and immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.